you haven't already done so, I invite you to grab your donuts and coffee and make sure that you've got the sheet for today. Let's begin in prayer. Holy God, thank you for who you are as you overwhelm us as on one level you terrify us and then turn right around and grace us and embrace us, as you transform us, as you shape us into your image. Be who you are, Lord, and do what you do to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, before we get into things today, this is today we're we're finishing up this series on holiness. Next next Sunday, first Sunday of December, first Sunday of Advent, we have a, a guest with a guest with us that will be um, Rhonda Stevens. We have been hearing a good deal about homeless teens in the last couple of years and getting more and more concerned about how we might respond. Rhonda Stevens is working with the working with homeless teens in primarily in the high schools and junior highs. She'll be here to, uh, to fill us in on what, this, what is the scene, what's going on, and ways that Bethlehem can more concretely help out. I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, next, that's next Sunday here. Um, just to run down the, the rest of the Sundays in December, second Sunday in December, um, we will have a, a one-shot class together on Matthew's infancy narratives, Christmas from Matthew's perspective. We'll look at Matthew 1 and 2. The third Sunday is the, Christ, the, the Sunday School Christmas program upstairs. And then the fourth Sunday, we'll look at Luke's infancy narratives, Christmas from Luke, um, Luke 1 and 2. And some Bible study on those two. And then the Sunday after Christmas, only one service and no class at all. Everybody will be sleeping. <laughs> okay. To get us into today, would you turn please to the book of Revelation? Near the back of the book, in case you're not in the normal that one. Book of Revelation, chapter 1. This morning we're looking at holiness in some of the last books of the Bible. Hebrews, the general epistles, Revelation. So we'll start with an experience of the holy here in chapter 1. Chapter 1 in Revelation, verse 9. Would someone read for us, please, verses someone who likes handling names of cities in ancient times? Would you read, please, verses 9 through 11? I, John, John is in exile on this prison island on the island of Patmos because of his Christian work, his testimony to Christ. Um, and while he's there, he is in the spirit on the Lord's day. This appears to be he's in some kind of a, I don't know if he's in a meditative trance or if he's worshiping or exactly what that means that he is in the spirit on the Lord's day. But in that, in that condition, he hears this voice. Um, write what you see, write it in a book, send it to these seven churches. So then he turns around to see who's speaking. Would somebody pick up from there then and read verses 12 through 16? Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden girdle around his breast. His head and his hair were white as white wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet 
were like burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth issued a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Thank you. I love how that starts. Then I turned to see the voice. Any of you ever tried to see a voice? <laughs> Never mind, that's just irrelevant. <laughs> what does he see? What does he see? Yeah, you've got these sevens of things, seven golden lampstands, seven stars, seven crowns. Yeah. Who is it he sees? Christ. It's Christ. That Even that phrase, one like a son of man. Of course, Jesus uses son of man often as his own designation for himself. But that phrase, one like a son of man, comes straight out of the book of Daniel as this uh, redeemer, this rescuer, who comes to bring in the kingdom at the end. Uh, and Jesus lays claim to that promise. So it's, our, it's for those who are steeped in those writings, it's tying right back into Daniel, and it's tying into what Jesus calls himself. We're meant to, to hear this as Jesus and as the one who comes at the end of time to bring in the kingdom. Okay, so the one like a son of man, one, a human-like a human -like one, not some beast, not some monster, not some whatever, but a, hum, a human-like one. Except as you look at him, does he look very human? I don't know. Eyes like flames of fire, everything is white like snow, uh, feet like burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace. His voice is like sound of many waters. And he's got this sword come out of his mouth. If you had to try to even picture the scene, it doesn't work very well. My grandmother used to, she was fascinated by the book of, book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. And she used to draw all of these things. I wish I had her notebook of drawings, they were so weird. <laughs> try to picture these in there, just bizarre. But what do you what do you make of all that? What do you, what is what is he experiencing? Does it sound like anything you've come across before? Revelation to John, but not to me. <laughs> Revelation to John, but not to me. <laughs> You've got, in terms of the imagery, it's tying into what is precious in, in the world at the time. And that's why as you look at these, at the, when you get to the uh, description of the heavenly city and all that, you've got lots of pearls and gold and gems and all the things that are precious in the world at the time. It ties into what the world values. It ties into what the world knows in terms of representation of divine beings and things like that. Um, this is typical of language like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That one hadn't occurred to me. Yeah, and that's the nature of some of these. Some of these images they're evocative, and they don't. Um, different people are going to respond to them in different ways. One of the things that is like is if you were to if you were to read back in the Old Testament at some of the theophanies, some of the experiences that people had of God, visionary kinds of experiences. When Moses and the elders see God on the mountain, 
when uh, Isaiah sees God in the temple, when Ezekiel has a vision of God. There's, there's similar language, legs like burnished bronze, um, eyes like flames of fire, wool like white like pure wool. That kind of language shows up in a lot of these theophanies, a lot of these appearances of God. Well, here's Jesus showing up like an appearance of God. Um, that's worth noticing right away. But this, what, 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 we're, what we're experiencing here, what we're seeing with John, is John is given an experience of the Holy, the experience of Jesus as the Holy One. This is that kind of primal, overwhelming experience that we've been talking about from the beginning. And we see it now again in the book of Revelation. And if you remember, what typically happens then when, whenever we do encounter something of God's power like that and God's majesty, um, we, re we suddenly see where we stand. And that's what comes next. Would someone read the next paragraph for us, please? 17 to the end. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I die, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Now write what you see, and what is, and what is to take place hereafter. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Thank you. Those seven churches you'll hear from in the next two chapters. They're individual letters to each of these seven churches. So you start to get some explanation of the symbols I'm not going to spend much time today on the symbols of Revelation. We'd be here for a long time, I think. And there's a lot of debate around them. Um, but what do, what do you see? And what, that, what do you recognize from what we've talked about before in terms of holiness here? What are you noticing? It says, fear not. Fear not. Yeah, so here's John's reaction. Very much like Isaiah's. Very much like that of Moses or anybody else. Just... I'm a goner. Here I am encountering God. I'm toast. There's, I, there's no hope left for me. He falls at his feet as though dead. Um, but Jesus responds. He puts his hands on him and says, don't be afraid. That's the first response. Don't be afraid. Then he tells him who he is, what his power is, and he commissions him for this work. Terry. His power over life and death, yes. Okay. Would you turn please to chapter 4? <coughs> it's interesting that John didn't recognize him. If this is, yeah, if this is the same John, there's some question as to whether it's the same John as the beloved disciple or not. If it is, but either way, it's interesting that he doesn't recognize him. But you're not seeing the Jesus that walked by the Sea of Galilee. You're seeing this transformed, heavenly, divine Jesus. That's um, a little overwhelming. If I remember when I was growing up, Dad used to talk about the book of Revelation, how you can make sense out of the first three chapters, and after that, who knows what in the world's going on. So for the longest time, I only read the first three chapters. I didn't read any farther. I thought it was a hopeless case. I think it's actually great reading. If you try, don't try to interpret it, just experience it. What happens after the first three chapters, the first thing that you see is John gets caught up into, caught up into heaven to see this heavenly worship that's going on. So chapters 4 and 5 are this marvelous picture of heavenly worship that really sets everything else in motion. And when you read it, you, you see a lot of the language that we have in our own worship service. The worthy is the lamb who was slain. To, that stuff comes straight out of these chapters. But uh, we won't look at the whole part, but let's look at chapter 4. Um, after this I looked, and in heaven... There in heaven a door stood open, and the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here and I'll show you what, you must, what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne, and one seated on the throne. Notice that the one seated on the throne is not named. 
This is a good Jewish writing. In good Jewish writing, you avoid the name of God. Because the name of God is holy and you don't want to accidentally abuse it. It's not like you can't use it, but you're careful with it and you talk around it. So here is this one seated on the throne. And you all know who it is. I don't have to tell this one's name. Okay? Seated on the throne. The one seated there looks like jasper and carnelian, and around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. You get a lot of, in these, in these, in these depictions, you get a lot of, it looks like, it looks like, language. It's sort of like this, it's sort of like that, and that's a clo as close as we can get. So here, precious stones and this emerald rainbow. If you look at a lot of medieval Christian art especially, this, you'll see these things depicted a lot. Now around the throne are 24 <laughs> thrones, and seated on the thrones are 24 elders, dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. If you're starting to hear language of the hymn, Holy, 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 it's not a surprise. Later on, they'll be casting down their golden crowns around the ga gla gassy, gl glassy, glassy sea. <laughs> okay. Um, a lot of the imagery of that hymn comes from this chapter. Twenty-four elders. Let's do a little interpreting just for fun. What does the number twenty-four say to you? You know that numbers are symbols in a lot of these. Twice the tribes. <laughs> Twice the tribes. Twelve. Twelve show up as the number of the people of God. You have twelve tribes of Israel. And in the New Testament, twelve, twelve apostles, twelve disciples. Uh, Jesus is doing that on purpose. He's using the number twelve intentionally to say something about the people of God. He's creating a new people of God. So now you have twelve and twelve. Is it the old and the new people? Maybe you can start thinking about that and playing with it. But here you have representatives of the people of God seated on thrones around the main throne. Verse 5, coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. We're back at Mount Sinai. With all of that, those theatrics, we're at this place of the holy where you're overwhelmed by this majestic, mysterious stuff. Um, in front of the throne burn seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. I thought there was only one. Seven, by the way, is the number of completeness. And so even to talk about the seven spirits of God are to, is a way to talk about the, 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 complete, the completeness of God's spirit in every place and time. Uh, that's one possible way to hear that anyway. Or maybe we only know the Holy Spirit and there are six others we haven't met yet. I don't know. <laughs> In front of the throne there is something like a sea of glass, a light crystal. There you got that picture. Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living critters, full of eyes in front and behind. That means they see and they know everything, right? Okay. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third with the face of a human, the fourth like a flying eagle. These are images taken straight out of the book of Daniel, where you have these, in the book of Daniel, it's each creature has four faces of these same four. Later on, these got interpreted as the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, but that, I don't think that's really what John means here, but I kind of like it anyway. Mark gets to be the lion. <laughs> Chuck just whispered to me glass wasn't invented yet so is there at that time was there another word that, or, I don't know anybody know about that? he may or may not be correct he did whisper that to me <laughs> does anybody know about that? I've never even I've never asked myself that question before <laughs> I guess I have an assignment, don't I? Okay. Mark, right. Mark yeah. when, when you think of seven, do you, you know, I grew up thinking of the Trinity plus the four corners of the earth equals seven? 
I, I grew up with some of that too, the, with maybe seven being the, the four, four is definitely the number of the earth in these writings. So you get the four winds, the four corners of the earth, the four cardinal directions. So four is a number of the earth in these symbols. And three, three tends to be the image for God. Um, whether thinking strictly Trinitarian, Trinity or, or not, but three is a, God, a number for God. Even back in the Old Testament, you've got the holy, 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 the thrice holy God. Um, whether the seven comes from the three and four together or not, I don't know. I remember he growing up with that too. I don't see any place in scripture that puts that together like that. Uh, so I don't know if we made that up or, or not. But seven is an important number throughout scripture for completeness and fullness. Um, you get it showing up in the seven days of the week and, and all kinds of things like that along the way. Mm -hmm. It could it could be. Yeah, and that that is a those kinds of that kind of thinking does seem to run around the world a lot with the, like the four the four um, basic elements and then adding some others to it to come up with seven. It's possible, but I don't see it in scripture anywhere. I don't see any place in scripture that really alludes to that, to let me think that that was what they were thinking. So I don't know whether it is or not. Um, the ox is very important because it was the, the development of the ox that stopped people from being nomads and being able to live in a community because the ox and the cow created more grain. So the ox is the creation of man being able to be in one place at all time. That's probably true. And once again, whether that's here in the thinking of these symbols or not, I have no evidence one way or another. And that's the place where, it, where we, we move very quickly into speculation, which always happens with the book of Revelation. Doesn't it? I know, but they're not always right. <laughs> they have their own ideas and their theories as well. And, I, for, and I, don't, I don't want to belittle those theories, but unless there is evidence for it in Scripture that that's the scriptural thinking, I don't want to import it into the Bible. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Um, verse 8. The four living creatures, each of them with six wings, so these are some kind of heavenly beings, full of eyes all around and inside, day and night without ceasing, they sing... Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever they sing this holy, 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 look at how everybody else responds. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one on the throne, the 24 elders f fall before the one who is seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast down their golden crowns around the glassy sea singing, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory, honor, power, for you created all things. You get more of the same, and it just builds more as you move into chapter 5. All I, I don't really want to get into all of the images and try to um, unearth everything. What I want you to see is, here is the experience of the Holy. Here is this visionary experience that John has given, and what we see is what we've been seeing all along from the beginning. But let's go back to the beginning. I want to recap that um, and just set where, set where we are now as we wrap things up today. First of all, I want to thank you for bearing with me while I've been uh, conducting my own little Bible study during... This is what happens. I get up, I start to think, what in the world is this holiness all about? And then I have to start digging into it. Um, if I were to teach this three or four times, then you'd get the nice finished version of it. you get the raw version this time around as I'm learning on the way. So if it has seemed chaotic along the way, it's because it's been chaotic along the way. That's why. But thank you for that. From the beginning, we've been looking at... The, at we've struggled with what is, what is holiness? What is the holy? Uh, and we came up with so many words associated with it, so many even contradictory definitions of it. 
Um, because it's a difficult thing, it's, the, the experience itself is something that's, that we can't nail down. Most of, many of us have had minor versions, even just such brief senses of awareness suddenly of something greater than ourselves. And we can't pin it down. And it's, it's overwhelming. And then it's gone. Uh, the kind of things we see in scripture are far bigger than that. But when human beings encounter the godness of God, the holiness of God, it's these things that were, I put them on the beginning of the sheet again. This sense of God's awfulness, fullness of power, it evokes dread. Uh, a sense of God's overpoweringness and majesty, God's unapproachable. A sense of urgency, vitality, will and force and movement, God's a consuming fire. A sense of God's mystery being completely other than what we are. We cannot, we can't even describe it. It's, it's like this, it's like that, but it's different from everything we know. And then at the same time, even as we're scared stiff by it, it fascinates us and draws us and we're hungry for it. Um, that's, that's the elemental experience of God. Most of us never get the, the full version of that. I've never had the full version of that, just tiny wisps from uh, now and then. But if that's, the, if that's the human experience before God, then the next thing is, what does that do to us? Who, who, do we just, who do we see that we are when that happens? And the experience is, I am small, I am tiny, I am mortal, I am gone, I am broken, I am unclean. There's something wrong with me, I can't stand in the presence of this. That's the automatic reaction when we encounter God's holiness. In the very first, I, brought, I was using that hymn, My God, How Wonderful Thou Art. And I think the old version of that has it right. So that second verse that says, How dread are thine eternal years, O everlasting God. Um, third verse, O how I fear thee, living God, with deepest, tenderest fears, and worship thee with trembling hope and penitential tears. And only then, after that hymn has acknowledged that God is God and I'm gone. I've got no hope. Then, yet I may love thee too, O Lord, almighty as thou art, for thou hast stooped to ask of me the love of my poor heart. We've got God's holiness overcoming the fear and stepping in with amazing compassion and love uh, for us. That's the, I think that's the central biblical message of all of this. In a way, we've been talking about our whole faith all the way through these, these weeks. Now, as we've talked about it, we've looked at it through uh, three different basic Old Testament models. One of them is the priest's approach to it. The second is the prophet's approach. And the third was uh, the sages, the, the wisdom approach. And what they all have in common is, here's the overwhelming experience of God, and with it comes a sense that we... Um, there needs to be, there, uh, the response, the human response needs to be human purity before God. There's a call for some kind of purity uh, in order to stand in God's presence. So with the priests, that involved the sense of order and everything, all, all creation being sewn together in this intricate way, and we keep unraveling it. And so with the foods that we eat, with our sexual expression, with our with bodily flows of different kinds, with skin diseases, and with all kinds of things that they dealt with on a daily basis. What fabrics they wore, how they sowed their seed, um, how, they, how they raised their animals. All of that played into a way to maintain creation in a way that promotes life rather than death. And that's the kind of purity it called for. Along with that is the sense that the holy is dangerous. God's holiness is dangerous. Now all I have to do is have you think back to that poor Uzzah, I think his name was, when uh, the Ark of the Covenant is being carried on that cart and it starts to wobble and he puts his hand out to steady it and he's zapped into toast and he's, you know, it's dangerous, okay? And so they're, they're, you, see, you set up these fences of holiness, around, these fences around holiness so that there are people, only a few people who can get into the center only a few times that you can get into the center. It's all graded 
and there are washings and purifyings in order to be closer and closer. You get this defensive sense of God's holiness, although it's us that God is defending, not God's self. The prophets, when they come along, they're, they're the heir of all of that, but they don't seem to pay very much attention to all of the physical accoutrements of holiness. They're not too worried about how close you are or, or those matters. Although, Isaiah in the temple, when he sees God's holiness, he's, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. So that same reaction is there. For the prophets, God's holiness focuses on relationship with us and God's vulnerability, that God can be wounded by our rejection and by our hurt of one another. And so God's in, in Hosea, God's saying, I'm not a man, I'm God. I'm, I'm not going to, I am the Holy One, I'm not going to come and destroy. I don't operate the way that you operate. Um, my compassion works differently. And the call for purity in the prophets is a call to justice. They're not so concerned about whether the right sacrifices are offered. They're concerned about justice, especially for the vulnerable. The sages, the wisdom literature, You've got that, the, 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 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's the experience of the holy God. The fear of the Lord is where wisdom begins, respect for who this God is. And then the way it plays out in terms of holiness is moral upright behavior in the community. So those are the three basic models that we get from the Old Testament of God's holiness. What they have in common is God is this overwhelming other who is there for us, and it calls for some kind of shaping of us, some kind of purity on our, on, our, on our part. The huge change that comes with the New Testament, as we saw, is when Jesus comes as the Holy One of God, um, we see the Spirit busting out of heaven, the sky is ripped open, and the Spirit comes out on Jesus. At the end of Jesus' life, as, the temp as he dies, the temple curtain is ripped. God is breaking out into the world. In the life of Jesus, you see God's holiness, not defensive behind the walls anymore, but out on the move. And so as Jesus touches impurity and sin and wrong, God's holiness is not damaged. Instead, Jesus transforms and heals and restores everywhere he goes. I think that's the biggest change that we see in the New Testament. The movement of holiness is outward, out to claim and to heal. Um, then from there, we've watched Paul and others uh, wrestle with these, what it means to be, to stand in the presence of God's holiness that has now claimed us, and what kind of purity that calls for from us. That was a quick summary of where we've been. Let me pause and see what you're thinking and what you want to raise before we dive in. Mm -hmm. This, I'm thinking on my feet. It seems to me that Paul, it seems to me that Paul is expecting his Lord to return any day. So I don't think Paul is too worried about building a transformed society. I don't think that's where he is yet. Um, and so if I had to choose between your options, I'd say the inadvertent. I think what Paul is doing is saying, here is... Jesus Christ has come and has, has holied us. Has, he's rescued us, he's delivered us, he has made us holy. He has made, he, now we belong to Christ, we are the saints. Now, let's live it. Um, and here are, the, here are the ways we're going to live it within, within the Christian society, within the Christian family. Right. 
and with effect on the world around as well. So I would say in, inadvertent in that sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But it certainly seems like he did that. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, just went a lot like Yeah. Yes, Shirley. I think of a Bethel picture years ago that said, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. I don't know if fullness of time is scriptural or not. It is. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Christ revealed to us a different God. What do you think? More accessible God maybe sounds mm -hmm. better. Personal. More accessible, more approachable, more personal. Yeah, it's. Um, it seems to me as I read the Old Testament that that same God is very much there all along, and what it, and the other parts of it are either the ways that we've understood God or they are God. God's tactics along the way. And they're never totally jettisoned either. Um, you'll still see those things poking up again to remind us who we're dealing with. In the book of Hebrews where it says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's New Testament. Okay, That's never gone. And I think sometimes because of how approachable God has become in Christ, um, then we tend to court the other danger that we make God into a pal. Um, and then, those other parts of scripture there are to remind us who it is that we're, I think John here too, John is a Christian already before this, and now sees Christ in chapter 1, and, oh my Lord, <laughs> literally, <clears throat> what am I dealing with? But you're right, the, and I guess the way I would think of it is this has been God's intent all along, that God had to set the stage and, and prepare for it to be. But that access and approachability is key. Well, I was just, I don't know if this is correct, but I was just thinking about how when I started my work and when Rose started his company, you start with a grand vision. You know, you have this overarching uh, vision of what you want to be. And then, you know, so you start macro and then mm -hmm. you go micro. Well, in your explanation, and according to the Bible, as I've seen it, is that you start micro, you know, with all the rules and all the, the little pieces and do this and don't do that. And then you go macro and see the grand vision of it all. I think there's, that's probably true. And another way to think about that is that um, God is cultivating a people all the way along and laying plans and move, moving us one step at a time uh, in order to accomplish something. God had to kind of create this people before this people could become a vehicle to reach the rest of the world. Um, so there's some tactical stuff that has to happen along the way. As I think about something like the Purity Code, for example, that we spent time on in Leviticus, all those strange laws, um, the more I look at them, the more convinced I am that they are, they are cultural and societal from, for that region, but that God has taken them and shaped them as a vehicle to say, I am for life, not death. I am a life giver, not a death dealer. And so all of these, the food laws, the, all of the practices are in one way or another a giant visual aid to say, my people, I want you to practice these things so that you will know that we are for life, not for death. Well, unfortunately, as time goes on, those very things that are symbols and signs of life end up being death dealing. So all you have to do is get the, get the rules set up in the right way, and then someone who falls outside the rules gets pushed out and killed or exiled or whatever, and gets labeled as unclean or a sinner, and now um, God has to find a way to transform that, to bring them in. And you can watch that process in scripture. Um, yeah, there's, 
God has not, in, in the, at this point, God hasn't spelled it out and said, hey folks, here's what I'm doing with all this. We're left to look at it and guess. That's, but I think there is a movement like that. Okay. Well, we are at uh, less than 10 minutes to go, and we haven't really started this yet. <laughs> I don't care. It's all right. Uh, let me give you a quick summary of some parts of it. On, on most of page one and page two, you'll find references to holy things and holy places and such that will be similar to Old Testament language, but almost always it's being trans, uh, transposed into a different key. And so, for example, the, the, and the, the, the bullet in the middle of page one about the holy city, the holy city is now the New Jerusalem not the old Jerusalem, it's the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. That's now the new holy city. Um, and, the, and the details around that reflect the newness that God intends. Um, on the next page, the top one on page two, the holy mountain, all the way through the Old Testament, if I hear holy mountain, it's probably going to be Mount Sinai where the temple is. Might be Mount, I'm pardon me, probably going to be Mount Zion, where the temple is. Possibly sometimes Mount Sinai. But in Peter, the holy mountain is the mountain of transfiguration, where Jesus was tra transfigured before his disciples. He takes that term, holy mountain, and moves it to a new place because of what happened to Jesus there. So you've got this transposing of all these images, and all of the old places and times and persons get um, relativized. They are no longer, we don't have a holy place. The holy place that we have now is Jesus, our temple. And we are his temple. And all of that gets transformed. The book of Hebrews, down at the bottom of page two, is one of the most interesting books, I think, in terms of holiness. Um, it'll use, the book of Hebrews is speaking to Christians of a Jewish background, so people who know all of the Old Testament stuff. Um, there appears to be some temptation to go back to the old and to, to leave their Christian faith or to add the old stuff to it. Not exactly sure what direction that's working. But in Hebrews, so in Hebrews then, the writer spends a great deal of time going back over the old stuff and looking at it from a new angle and uh, giving some new insight into it. And so, for example, I didn't put it in here, but when it comes to Sabbath, the holy time, Hebrews 4 plays with the image of Sabbath as the Sabbath rest that we have in Christ at the end when we are with him around the throne of God. There is a Sabbath waiting for us. But, wait a minute, that's not the Sabbath I thought we were talking about. It's typical of Hebrews. It's changing it to a different key altogether. So the sanctuary... Yeah, at the bottom of page two there, you'll see references to the temple. This is especially Hebrews 9, the holy place, the holy of holies. But as soon as Hebrews talks about the Old Testament holy place, now it shifts it into a different holy place. Um, look at the quote at the bottom of the page. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the sanctuary and the true tent, that the Lord, if not any mortal, has set up. We have a different temple now. It's not on this earth at all. Top of the next page. Can somebody read that long quote for us? You can skip the Greek. But when Christ came as high, high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who have been defiled, so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? Thank you. There's a lot stuffed in those four verses. What stands out for you? What do you hear? Once for all. Once for all. 
That's a key term for the book of Hebrews. It shows up a number of times. What Jesus did on the cross is once for all. It's, a, it's done. It's finished. It never has to be repeated. It did what it came to do. What else? Ties a bunch of Old Testament stuff to New Testament. Mm -hmm. To now. Yep. So if this did that in the Old Testament, think of how much more this does what in the New Testament. Yeah. So very explicitly there in 13 and 14, you've got the blood of these sacrifices sanctifying, purifying those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified. And it says, yeah, it did it. It did what it was supposed to do. How much more will the blood of Christ, who offered himself as a sacrifice without blemish, purify not our flesh now, but our conscience from dead works? There's a fulfilling of that or the maturing of that Yeah, and so he's not at all putting down what happened in the old. That was God's doing, and it was good. But now, uh, this has filled it, has fulfilled it. So that it purifies not only our bodies and our life situation, but our consciences and our, our inner being. Um, as you, um, and I know you're going to spend all afternoon reading through these and studying them. You always do, I know. I'm convinced of it. Um, do notice as you go on to the end of this, these pages that again, um, Hebrews will, will have the ongoing sense of sanctification, that, that the work of, of sanctifying us goes on. And so that for that you can have, there can be um, exhortations to pursue holiness. Um, that's the last one there under that one. So you can be exhorted to pursue this holiness that we've been given. And at the same time, sanctification, this making us holy, this making us fit to be in God's presence, is something that's already fully accomplished. Um, so turn, turn to page four. Um, look at the second quote on page four. It is by God's will that we have been sanctified. That's that complete perfect tense of a finished act that has an ongoing result. It's by, it's by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the blood of, of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It's finished. It's done. We have been made fit to be in God's presence and we belong to Christ. Now we're called to live in it and to grow in it and to stretch in it. Or, and here is one of the most, I'll close with this one, the one at the top of the page. It's one of the most bizarre Old Testament images that the New Testament ever uses. So here, Jesus is not likened to the sacrifice itself. He's likened to the garbage left over afterwards. The leftover bones and skin and entrails of the animal that were disposed of outside the camp. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the city gate. He's the rubbish of the sacrifice. In order to sanctify the people by his own blood. By Jesus suffering outside the gate, you have been sanctified. Hmm. Well, it's the end of our time, and we've solved everything. Um, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are holy, that you are God, that you are overwhelmingly who you are, and we are not. Thank you that, you, that your holiness has moved out to embrace us, to claim us, to forgive us, to restore us, 
to transform us. Lord Jesus, as we behold your face, and as you have made us your own, keep on transforming us. For your world's sake, in your name we pray. Amen. Marshall, you may be talking right.